Back on the national stage, we continue today's panels with part one of the 21st century criminal justice system and the criminalization of Latinos. Latinos represent 18.5% of the U.S. population, but comprise nearly 36% of incarcerated individuals. As of 2021, one in six Latino men born in 2000 or 2001, a 20-year-old in 2021, have a lifetime likelihood of imprisonment. At every level in the prison system, Latinos are overrepresented. This institutional demolition of our community needs to be reformed now. Together, we will learn how the laws in the criminal justice system are disproportionately applied to our community and what LULAC can do to reverse this troubling trend. Join moderator Leonard Morales, attorney at law, and our distinguished panelists for this important panel. Welcome, Leonard. Welcome to the 21st Century Criminal Justice System and the Criminalization of Latinos panel. We're here today to discuss the overcriminalization and overincarceration of Latinos in the United States. Latinos represent 18.5% of the U.S. population today, but comprise nearly 36% of incarcerated individuals. As of 2021, one in six Latino men born in 2000 or 2001 will have a lifetime likelihood of imprisonment. That's a 20 year old today. At every level, Latinos are overrepresented. This institutional demolition of our community needs to be reformed now. We're here to learn more about how the laws in the criminal justice system are disproportionately applied to our community and what LULAC can do to reverse this troubling trend. Today, we have an excellent panel of experts, researchers, and litigators. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Leonard Morales. I'm a criminal defense attorney in El Paso, Texas, where I was born and raised. Over the last 20 years of my practice, I've practiced in the areas of state, federal, and military criminal defense. I represent many minorities in our community who are facing years, often decades, of potential crim criminal prison time. I've seen firsthand how this type of demolition of our Latino community has impacted families, impacted our communities, and we're doing all we can to try and stem this terrible flood of criminalization. We'll also be joined by Patrice A. Sultan of the DC Justice Lab, Assistant Attorney General Kristen Clark of the Civil Rights Division of the US Department of Justice. Now, we'll move on to Ms. Patrice Sultan of the DC Justice Lab. Patrice, would you introduce yourself please to those watching? Good afternoon. Thank you so much for including me. I'm really grateful that this topic is being included and very honored to be among the other panelists um, speaking to the need for comprehensive criminal justice reform. Um, I run an organization in DC called DC Justice Lab that focuses on local transformative changes to our legal system. And our, our real focus is limiting the authority of police, prosecutors, and prisons. Before this, I was a criminal defense and civil rights attorney, and I've served on the DC Criminal Code Reform Commission, the DC Police Reform Commission, and the DC Jails and Justice Task Force. Wow, that's, a, that's quite a resume, Patrice. Um, I know you've been working on the reform of the DC criminal justice system. That, that sounds like a huge task. The criminal code reform project was a really exciting one, and I hope to see other states do it soon. Yeah, I, I, I would love to see something like that come to Texas. There's, there's a lot of things that need to be overhauled. My name is Kristen Clark, Assistant Attorney General for the Civil Rights Division at the U.S. Department of Justice. It's an honor to join so many outstanding leaders and advocates for this year's annual conference. LULAC stands tall as one of our nation's oldest Hispanic civil rights organizations. The storied organization came about at a time in our country's history when Hispanics were denied basic civil and human rights. Since your founding in 1929, you have successfully fought to integrate public schools work to ensure that Hispanics have access to the political process and responded to the spike in xenophobia and anti-Hispanic sentiment that we have witnessed. 
I am mindful that this year's convening is taking place as the country continues to engage in a national reckoning with ongoing racism and amid a pandemic that continues to wreak havoc on communities across our country. I am mindful that this event falls just a little over a year from the tragic murder of 22 people and attempted murder of more than 22 others at a Walmart in El Paso, Texas. These events remind us that while we have made progress, that progress is fragile and that we must keep pressing and pushing to ensure that all people enjoy equal justice under the law in our country. Please know that the Department of Justice is working around the clock to address some of the most challenging problems that we face as a nation. We're pushing to ensure constitutional policing and working to restore trust between law enforcement and the communities they serve. We're fighting to ensure that all kids enjoy access to equal educational opportunity, and that includes ensuring that no child is denied access to public schools because of their actual or perceived citizenship status. We're working to ensure that all communities enjoy access to the ballot box, and that includes efforts to restore the Voting Rights Act, one of our nation's most important federal civil rights laws. And we're holding accountable those who commit violent hate crimes in our country, including the defendant tied to that tragic murder in El Paso, Texas. I thank LULAC for your continued work and efforts to safeguard the right to vote throughout your proud history. I thank you for continuing to push that our nation be more just, inclusive, and equitable when it comes to the treatment of all people. Please know that the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice remains fully committed to ensuring that all Latinos enjoy equal justice under law in our country. Thank you. So Patrice, let's let's begin with some of the questions uh, particular to our, to our panel here. Um, let's start with, in what ways do you think the overcriminalization of Latinos is unique to the criminalization of other racial groups in this country? There are two things that immediately come to mind. I mean, as you noted in your introductory remarks, Latinx people are overrepresented at every stage of our criminal justice system. But one thing that's interesting about the data we have, which is limited in some ways, is that unlike other groups, right? If we look at black Americans representation, county by county, oftentimes things are disproportionately black, right? Like in DC, our entire criminal legal system is black. But there are a number of counties, a large number of counties, in fact, that have high ratios of Latinx people where almost all of them are incarcerated. And there are very few members of the free population who fall into that demographic category. The Prison Policy Initiative um, really spelled out what they call the Attica problem and maps out where these high ratio counties are. And it's a substantial number where nearly everyone in that community um, of color is being incarcerated. And that is a uniquely um, Latinx problem. The other issue is that our immigration system affects the way that police interact with brown people, even though we have, of course, black immigrants and white immigrants in this country, the anti-immigrant bias infects policing um, in a way that impacts people who are phenotypically Latinx in ways that, does, that it doesn't affect other people of color, other white people, even if they are immigrants. And it really impacts the way that people are treated not just at that first point of interception, but also at the time charging decisions are made, at the time sentencing decisions are made, at the time parole decisions and um, resentencing decisions are made as well. Yeah, I see that quite a bit myself, Patrice, in my practice. Um, I'm, I'm El Paso, if people don't know, is geographically located far west Texas. We're right on the border with one of the biggest cities in Mexico, which is Juarez, Mexico, which has kind of become synonymous with murder and crime and, and drug cartels and all those things. I, I, you know, so I see those things daily. I deal with those issues on a, on a daily basis. And immigration is also pervades everything. It, 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 
it is one of the questions that that we typically ask all of our clients you know what is your immigration status so that we know what we're dealing with uh, because obviously with with uh, with immigration issues comes consequences that result from criminal actions and that can affect someone's ability to to enter remain or stay in the United States so yeah I know I know exactly what you're talking about and how how unique it is to Latinos and Latinx people that that their immigration status and it's and it's different across our various different uh, I guess we could say flavors of Latinos right that's right and I think it's important to recognize and understand that our immigration system is part of our criminal justice system right criminal laws are laws that authorize punishment and detention and deep deportation are punishment, right? They're not collateral consequences of punishment. They are, in fact, punishment. Our Court of Appeals has explained that in many cases, deportation is a more severe punishment than a month's long term of imprisonment, for example. Detention centers are uniquely brutal, um, especially for people who have physical and intellectual disabilities. So it's really, really hard to separate those two systems and think of them as as different. It's it's a subset of our criminal justice system um, that we can't afford to ignore. Um, we're here now with Assistant Attorney General Kristen Clark of the Civil Rights Division, U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, welcome, Ms. Clark. And we'll get right into the questions. Why should criminal justice reform be a priority for LULAC? Everyone has a stake in ensuring that our criminal justice system is operated lawfully and effectively. And we all know that a person's involvement in the criminal justice system doesn't just impact them, it impacts their entire family and their community. Criminal justice reform is also a public safety issue, whether we're talking about communities that have lost trust in the police and are hesitant to report a crime or cooperate with investigations, or whether we're talking about bail systems that base pre-trial release on wealth and not the risk that they pose to public safety. We know that criminal justice reforms can help ensure that resources are dedicated to the most pressing problems and can ultimately help make our communities safer. Yeah, I agree, I agree. So Patrice, why should criminal justice reform be a priority for, for LULAC members? Well, for the reasons that we just talked about, right, the um, importance of the intersection between our immigration system and our criminal legal system is really important. You talked earlier about how enormous our criminal justice system is and how overrepresented black and brown people are. And so I think when we're working toward the advancement of Latinx people in any space, we have to understand and recognize that we are destabilizing every part of our social system, every part of our communities by allowing the removal, detention, arrest, and prosecution of people of color for things that are not handled by our criminal legal system in other neighborhoods or when other people stand accused. Um, so I think really the system itself is the most important reason to be concerned on behalf of an organization that's fighting for equality and equity because the entire system is destabilizing the ability of communities to move forward and make those other advancements in education, in housing, in economic opportunity. Um, we really can't do any of it if we keep removing people, breaking apart families and placing them in cages in mass. So Patrice, what um, for the members of LULAC, what sorts of resources would you recommend that, that, that our members lean on or learn more about to learn about criminal justice reform? And how does this intersect with our, I guess, our Latinidad, so to speak? My favorite research engines are Prison Policy Initiative and the Sentencing Project, who I know is going to be um, a, part of, a part of this event later today as well. Um, but really, we need more Black and Brown-led criminal justice organizations, not just to do the research and report out what's happening, but to really drive the change in our criminal justice system. So I can point you to a lot of large national organizations or even local organizations like mine, but really what I think it's important for LULAC, LULAC members to understand is that they're underrepresented in the 
community of people that's driving the change and need to be in leadership positions, even if that means starting new organizations or taking over existing organizations so that their voices are centered in the conversation. The people who are being impacted that much, right? 36% of the incarcerated population should be the center of the voices that we're hearing when we talk about what those changes should look like. What resources would you point LULAC members to to learn more about criminal justice reform? The Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department has many resources where folks can learn about criminal justice reform and learn more about what the division is doing. Our website, justice.gov, is a great place to start. Two great documents that you'll find there are one, the Civil Rights uh, Division's pattern and practice police reform work, highlighting work that we've done from 1994 through the present to promote more constitutional and just policing in our country. You'll also find a PowerPoint presentation that's an interactive guide to the Civil Rights Division's police reforms. Both of these documents can be found on our website at justice.gov. But I always think that learning must be a two-way street. I think that the Justice Department has to focus on listening and learning from everyone in the audience today. To help us do that, we released a new civil rights reporting tool, which significantly eases the burden by centralizing everything needed to file a report with the Civil Rights Division in one place. Now, by answering a few basic questions, all complaints through this portal are directed to the right office. It allows us to connect with a broader range of communities because it's fully accessible to people with disabilities and it's also available in English, Spanish, and other languages. Besides the new portal, community members continue to have the option to reach out through mail and phone pathways and we welcome opportunities to hear from LULAC members from all across our country. All right, welcome back everyone. Uh, We're still here with uh, Patrice Sultan. Um, And Patrice, I have a few more questions for you. So Patrice, um, how is the school to prison pipeline still manifesting itself in, in our community, in the Latino community? We haven't made as many strides as you might think in juvenile justice reform. Um, some, Some recent sort of milestones have been the highest courts recognizing that there is a difference between adults and children, right? That they're not just small grownups. They are fundamentally different in a lot of ways. And we've seen sort of at the deep end of the system, some abrogation of states' authority and ability to authorize the death penalty for children, authorize life imprisonment without parole for children. But there are a lot of intersections with our criminal justice system that aren't um, as serious of accusations that really still have lifelong consequences for kids who are being removed from school and punished for things that could be handled in the home, could be handled in their schools, or could be handled the way that we usually handle normal adolescent behavior, right? Um, And so we're still seeing that pipeline feeding black and brown children into our prisons and away from the, the opportunities that they should be able to enjoy in Washington, D.C., if you look at the, um, the youth population of committed children, meaning they've gone through our delinquency system and been adjudicated delinquent, it is 100% Black and Latino children. There are no white children represented in our youth system at all, even though the District of Columbia, as of this last census, has more white people than Black people for the first time um, in many years. So there's something fundamentally different about how we're treating children of color and we need to get to the point that we're treating kids like kids. Yeah, I see that as well in our communities, um, Patrice, you know, having have practicing here in Texas and New Mexico and, and Arizona, um, I see younger, it seems to be, feels to us younger and younger people uh, coming into my office with, with problems and issues and, and criminal cases that they're facing, you know, really serious kinds of, of, of accusations and charges um, that'll destroy the rest of their lives if they're not dealt with in a, in, in, in a very caring and, and deliberate way. Um, so I see exactly what you're saying. 
what advice do you have for Latinos looking to enter the legal field to create a fairer and more inclusive criminal justice system? Well, first is um, please do consider entering the legal field. One of my favorite parts of my week is teaching law students. And I work with them both as a professor of law, but also in my policy shop. And it's really, really rewarding work. But Latinos are underrepresented in our law schools and underrepresented in our bar and underrepresented in our benches, both local and federal. And so I think it's really important to see more lawyers of color um, in all of those spaces. And I would encourage people to consider beyond careers beyond litigation as well. Being in this policy space has been really eye-opening. There's so much power to change the laws and make them better than what they are. And so many roadblocks that we hit in our courtrooms because the laws are not written with our values and interests in mind. So those would be my two sort of biggest takeaways for people who are, who are thinking about law school or thinking about becoming attorneys is, is number one, do it. And number two, think creatively about everything that you can do with that law degree. Now, Patrice, what challenges do Latinos face when interacting with the criminal justice system and particularly, particularly through our legal lens? Well, one thing that we talked about a little bit earlier is the school to prison pipeline. And what's extraordinarily difficult about having um, people overrepresented as the population being um, subjected to the system and underrepresented as the people in power making decisions about what sentencing should look like and how that should be fashioned is that in our juvenile system, the courts are tasked with looking at risk factors and figuring out what children need. And without cultural competency and really understanding what those families are in need of, what those communities are in need of more broadly, we end up with solutions that are not well tailored to each individual child. And I think Latinos in the criminal justice system and the juvenile justice system are being sentenced in a way that is insensitive to what they should be getting, whether it's a, it's a rehabilitation or restorative justice approach that the court is trying to take, there's no way to do that without really knowing who it is that you're, um, that's in front of you. You can't just look at the nature of the offense alone. And so I think that status as a minority in a field that's dominated by, by white people at most stages is really problematic. Mm -hmm. You know, Patrice, I, I, I um, when talking to people and talking to clients, I, I noticed that we have a, there's a big difference. There's a, there's a knowledge gap that I, that I see in, with people facing or interacting with the criminal justice system with, with Americans, people that grew up here and sort of lived here, there's sort of a frame of knowledge. You know, you may have seen, you know, as fantastical as they are, these television programs with the trial going on, you know, people being questioned, you know, you can't handle the truth, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Where, whereas, you know, Latinos coming from, especially, you know, more Southern countries, Guatemala, Salvador, Colombia, you know, they don't have that frame of reference. And it's real hard to get them to understand what, what, uh, what they're going through and what to expect. Um, do you see that as well in, in your practice? Yes, I agree. I mean, I think it's, it's hard to imagine a more terrifying place to be than locked up um, in a system that you don't know what the rules are that govern whether you can be released or not. And that is something that um, is especially difficult um, when a person is from out of the country. It's especially difficult when there's a language barrier. Um, and we have done very, very little to ensure that our laws are written in a way that they can be understood by someone who is learning about the law through an interpreter. Um, just incredibly, incredibly frustrating to try to explain to someone in another language what most criminal statutes mean because they're written in a way that most English speaking people cannot understand what they mean. We just do a really terrible job of making sure that things are understandable and transparent and obvious in their meaning. And that was part of the reason that DC undertook a project to overhaul its entire criminal code at once, because it is just 
impossible to know whether you've committed an offense or not um, without having a law degree and a lot of training. Well, uh, Patrice, uh, thank you so much for your participation in the panel. And uh, we'd like to, first of all, thank all of them for their participation and, and uh, lending of their, of their time and expertise to this very, very important issue. And again, thank you, Patrice, for, for uh, sharing your time with us today. Thank you so much.